is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. Today, we are ta- talking a wide array of topics with Matthew Holt. He is the president of U.S. Integrity. We are going to talk about his company, new courses being offered at Ohio University, the NFL Draft, UFC betting. We're going to cover all the bases with Matthew Holt here in just a bit. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Feng. You can find his work over at thepowerrank.com. Ed, happy tax day, I guess, fake tax day to you. How you doing? Tax day, I, I'm doing well. I uh, don't have my taxes done, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah. My, um, my mom and stepdad are accountants. I have not filed my taxes yet. It feels very strange to me. Like I see yeah. the, the date of today and I get very anxious uh, because yeah. it's like, oh my gosh, I haven't filed my taxes. But we don't have to yet, so like everything is disorienting and time doesn't matter anymore, I guess. Yeah. So instead of tax day, we got some snow in Ann Arbor today. That was our <laughs> our present. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and you know, I mean, just a week ago it was seventy and complete spring, yeah. beautiful, perfect weather, and it was snowing today, which is just the glory of weather in Michigan. We had seventy degrees on Monday. I opened the windows in the apartment, and then. It was thunderstorming in 40 about three hours later, and we had snow on the ground this morning, too. Just a little bit, a little dusting. Uh, yeah. But Syracuse is erratic, yeah. and uh, it's hard to predict. Well, yeah, we got a dusting, but like it was coming down pretty hard yeah. um, a couple hours before we were recording this. I guess I don't mind the snow as much when I'm stuck inside. Because, like, I, whatever, I can't do anything anyway. It doesn't buy. I don't have to clean my car off to go to the gym or anything. So it's like kind of like whatever. I can look at it. Yeah. But I would love to open the windows. Like, if I can't yeah. get outside, I'd at least like to open. Just give me this one thing. This one very small thing. Let me air out the stupid place uh, for that's been sitting in, in, you know, still air for the past nine, eight months now, it feels like. So let yeah. me air out of my apartment. That's all I ask. Not asking a whole lot here. Uh, Coming up in just a bit, we're going to talk with Matthew Holt. You can find him on Twitter at Matthew Holt USI. As mentioned, he's the president of U.S. Integrity. And what they do is they monitor integrity and try to make sure there are there's no fraud occurring, essentially, um, across. You know, they do it for universities. They do it for um, conferences in college uh, athletics. And it's really interesting kind of the work that goes into it and, and everything that it entails. We're also going to talk the NFL draft uh, because they have essentially like an odds comparison site uh, for NFL draft props, which I've found super useful personally ever since you pointed out to me, Ed, uh, but also talking UFC because I don't know anything about uh, UFC, but Ed, you're the person who pitched having Matthew on the show. And I'm glad you did because he does a lot of stuff and has a pretty yep. interesting background too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I first heard of him when he was uh, on the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference on the gambling panel, and he was running the sports book with Cantor Gaming in Nevada. I uh, got the chance to get to know him when I was down in Costa Rica for one of uh, SBR's events down there. And then he went off about a year and a half ago to run U.S. Integrity and has been doing that ever since. And yeah, just, the you know, I've had him on my podcast. He's a great guest, uh, very knowledgeable all around. And that's what I like about having people who used to like run sports books is that yeah. they need such a wide array of knowledge that yep. we can pinball 15 different things Matthew's way and he will yep. know how to answer all of them. So I definitely appreciate that. Uh, it, it, you know, Chris Andrews, John Sheeran, same thing. Yeah. Um, so looking forward to talking with him last you week. Go ahead. You can't be just the numbers guy and run a sports yeah. book. Like no. you have to know many things and um, in, yeah, those guys, those guys all have very stressful jobs and I look up to all of them. Yeah. At least and, the ones uh, that do a good job. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, uh, Michael Lombardi talks a lot about how analytics aren't just numbers. They're also, it's just information. And it's I feel like that's super applicable to sports books. All information is analytics, and I think that's a, a good mindset to have uh, for stuff like this. Last week, we had J.J. Zacharyson on talking player props for the 2020 NFL season. That was a fun conversation with J.J. He had a couple of unders he wanted to bet. Uh, so if you want to check those out, search for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. We also had Danny Kelly of The Ringer on a couple weeks ago to talk about the NFL draft. So if you like NFL draft talk and want to hear what he has to say, Circle back around and find that one. 
We had uh, Kevin Cole on to talk NFL free agency. So a lot of good guests here recently. And John Shearer to talk horse racing, too. So expanding our horizons here on covering the spread the past couple of weeks with nothing uh, live to talk about. Today's podcast is brought to you by FanDuel Racing. FanDuel is doing its part to continue to bring sports fans excitement by offering users a chance to bet on horse racing. Use your existing FanDuel DFS login credentials to gain access to tutorials to learn more about the sport, including understanding how the odds work, the various types of bets, and most importantly, how to win your bets. Watch all the races live across over 300 tracks and and fill the void left in your sports fandom today. For more details, visit racing.fanduel.com or download the FanDuel app today. Eligibility restrictions apply. The John Sheeran episode pertinent for those of you trying out FanDuel Racing as well. And they also have a free-to-play DFS game around horse racing too, which has been uh, interesting for sure. John's info, great for that. Let's bring in Matthew Holt now to break down U.S. Integrity and talk a wide array of topics and the website for U.S. Integrity. If you want to check out more, usintegrity.com. Let's break it all down now with Matthew Holt. Covering the present. Let's bring in Matthew Holt of U.S. Integrity here to covering the spread. Matthew, first of all, thank you for coming on. I know things are a bit crazy right now. So how are you doing in this uh, wild, wild landscape we have going on right now? Yeah, we're hanging in there. We found some creative ways to stay busy. So thanks for having me on. What have you been doing to stay busy? I know it's probably a busy time of year for you just from a business perspective anyway. But uh, what have you been doing to keep yourself occupied? Well, thankfully, we have states like Colorado who, um, you know, have maintained their May 1 launch date. So even if there's not a lot to bet on, we have operators there that are looking to get launched, get through the licensing process. And with the integrity mandates that the state of Colorado has in place, it's giving us some good integration work to do with the operators there right now. And the NFL, at least somewhat, is still business as usual. So, you know, we've kind of refocused our biz dev efforts um, toward the NFL right now. Yeah, and it's kind of all you can do at this point uh, because there's nothing else going on. So let's talk about your company here. It's U.S. Integrity, and it works to monitor the integrity of sports betting in the country. And it's obviously, there's a lot that goes into that. So what all goes into that process, Matthew? And what role do processes like that play as sports betting expands in the U.S.? Sure. So it's kind of a three-tier process. We work with tier one, which is leagues, conferences, universities, teams, tier two being operators, and tier three being regulators. And we get real, real-time real and archive line movement from the operators, as well as anonymized level real-time bet data from the operators. We get information from regulators, including cooperation, which is always important, and an investigative arm. And then we cover the leagues as much as we can for abnormalities, whether it's through potential point shaving, match fixing, misuse of insider information, player and ref safety issues. We look for abnormalities within those wagering markets and any correlations within uh, to abnormalities within the events, then we can uh, you know, kind of narrow it down to bets placed, who may have placed those bets, correlations they have is to uh, you know, any nefarious activity, use the regulators as a resource to find out who is actually placing the bets we're seeing come across and, and do investigations there. So it's a wide gambit and it includes, you know, social media monitoring, underage betting, student athletes betting that shouldn't be, people betting that shouldn't be even if it's legal in certain states, um, and then player and referee safety. But at the end of the day, the the, the I guess what gets the most popularity is, you know, the potential match fixing, point shaving, misuse of insider information, which is obviously the most prevalent in the US. So so Matthew, with your business, like we like to think that like all the point shaving things are very rare and and you know hopefully a small part of your business. Is that is that really true across all sports? Yeah, I do think that point shaving is much more rare. But if we look at recent history, let's say the last 25 years of scandals that have actually got not only caught, but prosecuted in the United States, Northwestern, Toledo, San Diego, Tim Donahue, Arizona State. The one thing we know that that recent history tells us in all those examples is that the perpetrator in those cases wasn't involved in some multi-million dollar scheme. It was an athlete that was getting two, $3,000, in many cases less. I mean, Adam Cuomo in the Toledo situation, the running back at $1,200 to fumble in the bowl game. Northwestern basketball players getting $1,000 
Um, you know, San Diego University very recently, 2014, Brandon Johnson, their all-time leading scorer and assist man, was going to play professional basketball, was getting about $3,000 a game. So it's not these multi-million dollar schemes that we normally see. It's student athletes either getting caught up in a jam and needing a few thousand dollars or professional athletes or officials many times getting extorted into it. I think the social media aspect of this is really interesting. How can you use social media to help with the services that you offer here? So many ways. Number one is referee and player safety. It's amazing the amount of threats. We saw the Macy Oteague article in ESPN earlier this year where Baylor won by eight on the road, but as an eight and a half point favorite, Macy Oteague misses a couple of inconsequential free throws at the end of a game. He goes onto campus the next day thinking, great, I'm a hero. We won again, kept our undefeated road streak going. And yet he got hit with all this hate mail on social media, including death threats. And he was overwhelmed by what's going on here. We won by eight on the road. Um, so we make sure that in those situations, because we work so closely with the FBI and regulators, that these death threats aren't coming from someone in the arena, right outside the arena, waiting at the player's hotel form so that they can avoid conflicts there. You know, referees, the, the collegiate folks never announce in, in the NCA or the conferences who the referees are going to be for any particular college football or college bas basketball game intentionally. Yet the, this information in the past has leaked due to some, you know, less than stellar practices and procedures. And then all of a sudden you have people making death threats to officials and where those officials are going to be leaking ahead of time. So we try to help with best practices and procedures to tighten up who has access to where referees are going to be. And at the end of the day, people just post dumb stuff as far as kids that are underage betting, student athletes who shouldn't be betting regardless of their age because their participation in their sport, um, the student, again, the safety issue. And the number one thing that we end up using social media for is information tracking. When was information actually released? Whether it's from a credentialed inside locker room source or not, we have to follow when information on a certain suspension, injury, ineligibility issue happens so we can kind of get an idea of when a leak may have started uh, when those issues come up. So Ohio University announced that it will be offering some online education programs, uh, and you guys are involved in that. What can we expect with these courses? Yeah, I mean, Ohio University, what a partner. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, they run the most prestigious uh, sports administration master's program in the country. And basically the next wave of sports administrators, athletic directors, compliance directors are coming through that Ohio University program. And the one thing, you know, one of the people that guest lectured on that, Bob Bolin, the integrity officer from Penn State, one of his lectures was, so sports betting got dumped on your desk, what do you do now? And people forget that these athletic directors and, and compliance directors at all these universities have been told for the entirety, entirety of their career, stay away from sports betting, sports betting's bad. And all of a sudden, sports betting's on their desk and they have to understand how does this affect mental health of our players, education for our players, what further risks and, and vulnerabilities do they suddenly have because sports betting's there? One of our clients, the University of Pittsburgh, directly across from their football stadium is Rivers Casino. Well, what does that mean? Is it a new vulnerability? Is it a new risk? So we want to work directly with all of these sports administrators, athletic directors, trainers, everyone to let them know what the risks are, what the vulnerabilities are. One of the best examples is we do lots of presentations to coaches, especially at collegiate football and basketball, who for the entirety of their career used injuries and eligibility issues as sort of a gamesmanship uh, pr practice. And now we have to tell them that if you're not transparent about injuries and eligibility, and especially if you're misleading about those, you're putting your coaching staff, your players, your equipment managers, and your training staff at a higher risk of vulnerability, because if betters know that you'll never release this information, then the odds makers can never get it. You just have actually created an underground market for this information and put the remainder of your staff at risk. So there's a lot of information we think that these sports administrators know. It's go at your own pace. It's an online certificate program. And we're trying to do CLE certifications within each state. All these attorneys that are suddenly working in the sports betting space, we think it's important that they're able to get educated on it and while getting their CLE credits done as well. 
I think that this is all really interesting because in past years, there has been discussion around maybe having a like sanctioned injury report for college football and stuff. And that hasn't happened yet. Do you think with the advancement in legalization of sports betting, we could eventually get to that point? Or is that still kind of a pipe dream? It's a little more of a pipe dream than we may think. I know those things have been presented by folks at the NCA and the folks at the conference levels before, and they get a lot of pushback from the universities and the legal folks at those universities because they sort of face enhanced uh, HIPAA and other, you know, private uh, medical security it, you know, issues around that. You know, the HIPAA issues, kind of the waivers that get dealt to professional players are a little bit different in the college ranks in terms of disseminating someone's private medical information without their consent. So I think the bigger concern right now, it's not the coaches, it's not the participation or engagement or, hey, will people think of this as us engaging in sports betting as we do it? From what I'm hearing, it's more of a legal issue and more of a HIPAA kind of issue than it is with anything else with the collegiate folks. I think they want it. I think they know that it's it's beneficial to their programs to have it. And eventually I think they'll get there, but I think they need to restart restructuring that the, the waivers that student athletes signed and the ability to redisseminate people's private medical information. Um, you guys offer a lot of services comparing odds for draft props. Has this market been different this year compared to the past, just because we kind of have limited information, there's not as many workouts and pro days and so on and so forth. Extremely. And I will say this. I mean, we've never made any information uh, available to the public before. It's always been just strictly to clients, operators, regulators and teams. And this year we decided to make that information available to the entire public because this information has been I mean, this market has been so much more volatile this year. And it's not just the volatility in the marketplace this year. It is massively expanded liquidity because with nothing else going on, the amount of people suddenly trying to take advantage, promote, engage with and bet on the NFL draft has massively, massively expanded. So this used to be a very sharp marketplace information driven people really searching for information trying to stay ahead of it now you have so much money in this uh in this marketplace that you never did before and i think some of that mark some of that money is triggering some false kind of positives or false alerts to the sports books who are moving lines off money not necessarily knowing whether it's sharp research money info money and then they're having to react later when the info is different so a lot of volatility in this marketplace this year what has it been like trying to track it, given that there are a lot more markets being offered? Because like you said, there's nothing else to bet on. So like sports books have more times to focus on this. Has it been tough for you to keep up uh, with just so much going on in this sphere this year relative to past years? Yeah. And, and normally, look, let's face it, even though there's similar to the Super Bowl, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of things you could bet on. Normally in the last few years and when we started this in Nevada, when I was still a canter, there would be about 20 markets offered, really. We're in well into the hundreds of markets being offered now. We're offering players. We're seeing players offered with over under draft positions in the 70s and 80s and, and in a couple cases in the hundreds. That was never the case before. You were really taking the top 10, top 15 players, players that you were really sure were going to go in the first round on that Thursday giving them a draft position and then doing a couple SEC versus the fields, Alabama over under LSU. But now, I mean, it's just, un they have Auburn over under one and a half players in the first round, right? I mean, we're, we're getting so narrow now with all of it. It's just absolutely amazing. And when you look at these draft pops, uh, is there anything that stands out to you as being super attractive in terms of having value? So there's a lot of middles. I will say this. If you shop around with books, there are several players where you can find ranges. J.K. Dobbins is one. William Hill has his draft position at 53 and a half. FanDuel and Fox Bet, 44 and a half. Almost a nine spot uh, middle in between. Look at Jake Fromm, a very popular player in this draft, the quarterback coming out of Georgia. William Hill, 70 and a half is over under draft position. DraftKings and Fox Bet, 60 and a half. A full 10 slots in between there um, where you could take advantage of some wide ranges. The one that I think is kind of the most interesting, while Tua may get all of the love from the media and all the talking, it's another quarterback where we're seeing the most volatility, and that's on Jordan Love. We've seen Jordan Love's draft position in this NFL draft wagering 
as low as 11 and a half, 12 and a half last week at William Hill. This week it went all the way to 15 and a half, 16 and a half, 17 and a half, 19 and a half. Your current over under draft position on Jordan Love, a full seven spots different than he was last week. Last week, Jordan Love was kind of the Cinderella of this draft. All of a sudden, his popularity with betters is just absolutely plummeting, and we've seen him drop seven spots. And it's not just different markets for Jordan Love either. If you look specifically at FanDuel, I was looking at his market, I think, like two weeks ago. The, the over-under was 14 and a half. Then a week later, it was 17 and a half. And like you said, they are one of the sports books offering the 19 and a half numbers. So I think that he's super interesting. Do you have uh, a thought on Jordan Love? You know, are you leaning a certain way on him? Or is it just fascinating to track the way this market has gone with him? I think 19 and a half feels about right now. You know, obviously, we don't really bet here for conflict of interest uh, reasons. But I tell you, I wish I could have had that 12 and a half now because I think I think there was a lot more love with Jordan. I mean, a lot more love for Jordan Love, excuse the pun, right out of the gate than than really the true experts thought was realistic for where he may go and where he may fit. Um, And I think now that we're getting down into more realistic expectations, I just think for whatever reasons, whether it was the media coverage, the comparisons to Pat Mahomes that some people were making with his ability to uh, to move and have a huge arm. uh, I think that stuff got overblown early and we saw some really, really soft numbers open up on Jordan Love and the market quickly hit those numbers. And we've seen a massive adjustment. We originally intended to talk a lot about the UFC event that was going to happen this weekend. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen at all. But maybe uh, with your knowledge, you can give us a little primer for UFC betting, things that you look for, and for, for people that are interested in that. Sure. I will start this off where I, I still don't understand how WWE has been considered an essential business, <laughs> uh, and yet UFC can't put on an event where, to me, it's still two people in a ring with a referee, whether they're fake fighting or really fighting, but... Um, you know, I'll, I'll keep that aside for this one. Look, there's some great resources out there. And then it, here's the resource from a gentleman I don't really even know that well personally. Uh, we just communicate via social media, but does a great job. His name is Dan Tom. And if you go on social media, he offers all this information on the strengths and weaknesses of a fighter's striking ability, grappling ability, wrestling, takedown defense. And while I would never use it holistically as okay, you know, this is how I'm going to break down a fight. Sometimes it's it's important to understand a fighter's background, especially a fighter that we haven't seen fight a lot. So a lot of these fighters come from wrestling backgrounds, and all of a sudden they get in the UFC and they have a few fights and they're striking. Justin Gaethje is a perfect example. Just All of Justin Gaethje's wins in the UFC have come by knockout. And if you were a novice watching Justin Gaethje, you would think he's a wild brawler with a uh, you know boxing background or a kickboxing background, but Justin Gaethje is a race as a wrestler. He was a, a collegiate All American wrestler, so it's interesting to understand that his base is wrestling, and that if a wrestler comes in and tries to just take Justin Gaethje down, he does have that skill set to at least use that wrestling defensively to stand on his feet, where he can then use his strength. So. I think it's important to understand all of the fighters' background, their history, and their skill sets, and how they may be applicable to fights. Um, And now what we see so often is fighters are getting away from these massive weight cuts that we used to see. We used to see fighters that walk around at 200, 210 pounds, cutting down to 170 pounds for a fight. And, And you didn't know how those weight cuts would go or how they would affect the fighters. But now with all the USADA testing, the fact that they can't use IVs to rehydrate, we're seeing fighters um, make less and less of these weight cuts, these big weight cuts. And now all of a sudden you have to determine what does that mean to a fighter's style? Is suddenly his size going to be disadvantageous at moving up in a weight class? Or fighters like Jose Aldo that continue to move down, who used to Everyone thought he'd fight at 155. He's all the way down to 135 now. Understanding weight cuts and what it's going to mean to that fighter in this particular instance is also very important. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got to go back and, and you've got to do a full history of a fighter. At least, uh, is he improving in these areas? Is he not improving? You know, and the one mistake that a lot of people make is looking at a last uh, a fighter's last fight, especially if that fighter is coming off a knockout victory. They always go, oh, my God, that knockout was so impressive. Anytime a fighter is coming off a knockout win, there's almost always 30 cents of value lost 
on that fighter coming off the spectacular knockout win um, just because there's an overwhelming response to that one instance. So I would look to look to play against fighters coming off spectacular knockout wins because oftentimes you're already getting overpriced on that fighter because of the last fight. That's super interesting. And it makes sense, too. We see this overreaction to recent data in other sports, too. So it's easy for someone to make that transition from betting other sports to betting UFC in that instance, for sure. And we're very much a data-driven podcast here, Matthew. So are there any resources you recommend for UFC data? And are there any key metrics we should focus on when we're trying to look at the numbers? Or is that not as applicable to UFC? It depends on the matchup now. You have to understand. And what I always say, especially when I'm betting underdogs in the UFC, and and that's what a lot of professional or more advanced uh, UFC or MMA bettors like to look for is betting underdogs, is if you're going to bet an underdog, you have to have that path to victory. So if you're looking for a path to victory for a fighter, you have to be able to go back. And again, Dan Tom, he runs a site. I forget the name of it right now. But if you look at Dan Tom on Twitter, um, he, he does some really good job with metrics there. There's fight metrics. And, and what you want to know is, okay, so maybe my fighter can't win a kickboxing match here, or he's likely to le- lose a striking battle. But does he have the wrestling chops to get this fight to the ground? And if so, does he have the submission capabilities to potentially end the fight if he gets there? Same thing with maybe you're going against a jujitsu ace and you say, okay, my only shot is to win by knockout. But how realistic is it that the fighter I'm betting can win the fight by knockout, can win this fight striking. So I think that the metrics are important, but unlike other sports, they're not always applicable. And especially when you're betting underdogs, I would say, what is the the path to victory for the fighter I'm betting? Is it he can win by knockout? He can win by submission? Can he win, uh, by, can he win a decision through volume striking or controlling the ground game? So we always look for a path to victory because if there's not a path to victory, there's no sense in betting them. I think that's uh, very helpful. That is Matthew Holtz. Uh, Matthew, really appreciate the time and covering a wide array of topics here today. So really appreciate you swinging by. Uh, Hopefully you can stay safe and stay healthy. Hopefully we're talking about actual sports happening again here in the very near future. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Best of luck with everything. Stay uh, Stay safe, stay healthy. Talk soon. Covering the future. Once again, a big thank you to Matthew Holt for swinging by and talking about everything, essentially, uh, covering all the bases. Like I said, nice to have people on who have a, such a wide array of knowledge. Find Matthew on Twitter at Matthew Holt USI. And if you want more information on how USI works, again, just go to usintegrity.com and it's they kind of lay everything out. They talk about the social media aspect and all that's really interesting. Ed, I thought it was interesting to hear him talk about the the way you can price shop for quarterbacks because it seems like after Tua and Burrow, there's a lot of uncertainty this year. And even, I guess now with Tua, there's uncertainty too. But yeah. uh, it's a it's a fascinating market to look at right now as the quarterbacks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, some so I, There's been a lot of rumors floating around that Justin Herbert's going to go ahead of Tua, which I would have a good laugh at good <laughs> on <luck>. Thursday night. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, Jake Fromm is super interesting to me, right? Because, you know, uh, I was looking at some some mock draft data from the beginning of the college football season, and he was considered like a top 10-ish pick. Um, did not have the season he wanted at Georgia. Uh, don't know if it was entirely his fault. I know they had some issues at receiver. You assume a program like Georgia is just going to replace the the guys who leave for the NFL with guys that are just as good. And, and that didn't quite work out for Jake Fromm this year. And you always wonder what his numbers would be like with – maybe a better supporting cast. So, you know, if you put him at LSU with the receivers they had and uh, put Joe Burrow at Georgia with a disappointing set of receivers, uh, where would their draft position be? And I would argue they would be very different. And we've seen Jake Fromm get it done, uh, you know, even as a true freshman. Uh, Really interested to see where he ends up. I mean, he's clearly, you know, in the discussion, you know, to be drafted. You know, does he end up, you know, does end up like a late, pick with like new england obviously a, a team that's that's looking for long term you know getting some guys that could potentially um you know be their next long-term quarterback so he's he's a fascinating guy for me i love jake from um i like adore 
the fact I think that he's just super underrated personally. Um, right. I've written about him a couple times for for Number Fire. I almost talked about him in covering the future today. Decided to go against it, uh, but because they have a draft prop up of Jake Fromm versus Jacob Eason at FanDuel Sportsbook, and hmm. Fromm's I think like plus one forty now to go ahead of Eason, um, even Wait. though Georgia. Right. literally made this decision. I, I, it's hard to like appeal to authority here because they chose wrong with uh, Justin Fields, obviously. Uh, but right. Jacob Eason's not Justin Fields. I think we can say that pretty definitively. Uh, right. But the thing that I, I find super interesting with Jake Fromm is that his schedule was like hideous. Like, sure. He, I know we talk about Joe Burrow facing all these like top end defenses, but Assuming that Jake Fromm gets drafted, he will have had the fourth toughest schedule of any FBS quarterback drafted in any round since 2010. The guys mm-hmm. above him, I think, are, uh, I think that Jake Locker's actually on that list, which is probably not a great example. Uh, but, like, <laughs> it's the fourth toughest of all time. So when you look at his his 8.1 adjusted yards per attempt, like, that's kind of understandable. I mean, again, Joe Burrow faced tough schedule, too. Tua Tungavailoa did, but... We're not comparing him to them. And Jacob right. Eason's going to go ahead of Jake Fromm, even though Jake Fromm's worst season by adjusted yards per attempt was better than Jacob Eason's, even though Jake Fromm is a year younger than Jacob Eason with 15 more games of experience Jacob Eason, uh, even though we saw a program literally choose Jake Fromm over Jacob Eason already. Right. It's super confusing to me, uh, yeah. but I would love to see what Jake Fromm could do because I think he's... He's a fascinating guy. Okay, the other thing, too, is I was looking back at past non-first-round quarterbacks who have been successful in the NFL. And the list is not very long. Uh, There have been nine guys who have been the top ten in in net expected points since 2000 who have been taken outside the first round, nine total quarterbacks in that time. And I tried to see, like, their listed strengths and weaknesses coming out of the draft. And seven of those nine quarterbacks had accuracy listed as a, a strength, which I would list as a strength for Fromm. And five of the nine had arm strength listed as a negative. That includes right. Tom Brady, <laughs> Tony Romo, and guys like that. So yep. I think guys like Fromm get underrated in the draft, whereas guys like Eason get overinflated because of the yep. arm strength. And I, I prefer the Fromm type guys. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, so for, first of all, Fromm is probably underrated. I didn't have a great season this year, but also maybe his height, only being six two. His hands I'm sure are small Eason too. Is, yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure Eason's kind of your prototypical 6'6", big boy. Um, and then uh, just another thing about arm strength, you know, we, we it doesn't stop when just after a guy's been drafted, we continue to talk about it. We had all these conversations about Drew Brees yes. uh, last year and whether it was arm strength and yada, yada, yada. And, and I kind of just disagreed with it. Uh, it was interesting. I was just looking. He did have the lowest A dot uh, average depth of target of any quarterback. <laughs> Uh, in the NFL with, you know, a certain number of attempts last year. But but does it matter? I mean, he's right. got the accuracy. He's got Michael Thomas. I will take that offense any day of the week, right? right. Um, it's And they're going to be, you know, presuming that he can perform near the level that he has in the past, like they're going to be a Super Bowl contender again. Yep. I think the interesting thing with Fromm, too, is that I always got mad because I felt like Georgia wouldn't let him open it up during the season. Mm. We talked about that a lot, actually, on the show, how bad I was at Georgia. But he actually had the highest percentage of his throws go 20-plus yards downfield of any of the top quarterbacks in this draft. He's at 19.5, and Jalen Hurts is at, like, 19.3, I think. They're basically neck and neck, and everyone else is below that. Um, So he did try to go deep, just wasn't always super successful, whether that be – because of him potentially or the receivers it was weird but i agree that jake Fromm is really really interesting and one team that has been tied to jake Fromm quite a bit is green bay packers and you're covering the future today is talking about those packers they were a plentiful uh subject of conversation here on the show throughout the fall yeah. which may have led us to believe that we could bet against them yeah. for this year but it yeah. looks like markets may be accounting for that so what do you see with the packers here at yeah, well, I mean, let's go back to the preseason. Uh, you know, Green Bay was at nine and a half wins, and uh, I think I, I, I definitely leaned or maybe even liked the over uh, on that. You had Aaron Rodgers coming back, first time he was going to be healthy in a long time, and I thought they had a promising young secondary with a lot of top draft picks. So they go 13-3, and three, clearly go over the nine and a half wins, so I look like a genius, right? No, not at all. Uh, the Pack got extremely lucky last year. They ended up nine and one in one-score games. 
which is just incredible. Um, record in one score games tends to regress to the mean, uh, you know, very rapidly season to season and, and even in season. Um, so the, the record, you know, they weren't a 13 and three team. And I think anyone who watched them would, would agree with that. Uh, the defense really struggled. You know, they were 23rd when I look at adjusted success rate, you know, they had, they had the scheme where they were trying to put a lot of defensive backs out there to stop the pass at the expense of stopping the run. And they were terrible trying to stop the run, but they weren't very good. Uh, you know, they weren't elite at all uh, in pass defense, only 12th in my adjusted passing success rate. You know, and Aaron Rodgers wasn't great last year, you know, an offensive passing success rate. They were 18th. So, you know, with a 13 win team, you automatically think that their win total is going to be like 10 and a half and just auto bet, you know, under with with what we think this team has. But, you know, if Fanduel Sportsbook, they're sitting at nine wins, slightly shading the under. And when I take those nine wins and the price to go over and under for all teams and I back out a rank and a rating for all teams, they end up 11th. So, yeah, I think that's about right. A little bit better than average. Uh, definitely not a Super Bowl contender in my eyes. Um, we'll see what they do in the draft, whether they can get uh, riders some more weapons. I think that's what a lot of people are predicting for them in the draft. But, yeah, you know, markets are tough, right? You know, you think you have this one and, and it's just, uh, you know, one that you're really going to like and – Nine wins sounds about right. Yeah, I, I was expecting to go into this year betting against the Packers because I thought that, like you said, like 13 wins, they're going to be overinflated because of that. But like right now, they're plus 165 to win the NFC North. And that's with Nick the Nick Foles-Mitchell Trubisky hybrid type thing in Chicago <laughs> with the Vikings having crazy salary cap issues and having to shed a lot of guys this offseason with the Lions being coached by Matt Patricia. Like... Plus 165 is not super advantageous as a number, but it's not bad either. So I think they're super fascinating. Do you think that you're going to get to a point where maybe you buy into the Packers, or do you think they're more so just being appropriately priced? I think that's where I settle right now, is I think they're appropriately priced and not being undervalued, but I'm at least monitoring them, I guess is what I'd say. Yeah, for sure. I'm monitoring them too. I mean, I'm not high on this team. I haven't been since like I saw them play and it's interesting that our expectations are lower than last season after a 13-win right. regular season. Yeah. But but I think that's right. Yeah. It's really interesting. Uh, they did lose Brian Balaka, the right tackle, which stinks because he's really good. Uh, but they'll be a very interesting team. And I think that if they can get some more weapons on offense, maybe I can buy into them. But not there yet. Just monitoring as of right now. For my cover in the future, I want to talk about a team that is hyper-relevant for the NFL draft because the Bengals, they're picking first, and they're going to pick Joe Burrow first overall. Now, the Bengals, I wouldn't say quarterback is their biggest need because Andy Dalton, like, he's not great, but he's serviceable. So the move from Dalton to Burrow isn't necessarily a huge immediate upgrade for them, but I still like the over on their team win total at five and a half. Uh, It's minus 105 on the over, and I think it's a pretty advantageous number. There are a couple reasons for that. The first one is that Burrow is not the only guy they're adding to this offense because A.J. Green will be available. He missed all of last year, which gives them A.J. Green, Tyler Boyd, and John Ross. And those are three good receivers with super complementary skill sets. You could... debate if John Ross is good, but he serves a role in that offense, and that role, as we saw at the Eagles last year, is a valuable one. They're also going to get last year's first-round pick, Jonah Williams. He missed all last season due to injury. He got hurt in July. I think he was lifting. Uh, Missed the whole year. He can slot in at left tackle. He was, I believe, the 11th overall pick out of Alabama last year. They can get him at left tackle. Might be able to add a right tackle at pick 33. I think there are some interesting prospects there that should be available around that time. So, potentially adding two new tackles along with A.J. Green and Joe Burrow. That's awesome. And then there's a defense. And they've actually been pretty aggressive in free agency, which never happens with the Bengals. They've they've always been super conservative. But this year, they've added D.J. Reader, Von Bell, some other potential starters at cornerback. So I don't expect the Bengals to be great with Burrow, just because I don't think the upgrade necessarily there is, like, huge right now. But getting just minus 105 on and over a five and a half is pretty enticing for me. We did talk about the Panthers um, betting the over on them at five and a half a couple weeks ago. And I still like the Panthers number more than the Bengals. But both the Panthers and Bengals, I think, are good bets to go over on low win totals this year. We talk about betting towards the mean. 
They're both at five yeah. and a half, and I think there are reasons to like the overs there. So I'm going to back the Bengals, which feels strange because they were they were a true dumpster fire last year. But I think it is the right play here. Any thoughts for you on the Bengals? Ed? Well, I kind of I mean, do you think they're going to keep Dalton around to mentor the young quarterback? Or so I was listening to uh, the Ring Ran NFL show. Uh, Kevin Clark was hosting this week, I think, with Charles Robinson of Yahoo Sports, and they were talking about how. Zach Taylor said this, if you're going to have a guy like Andy Dalton in the room any year, this is it. With an abbreviated offseason, with a, you know a lack of organized team activities, and they were talking about maybe holding Dalton until preseason, seeing if a team has an injury and has a need at quarterback, and then pulling like a Sam Bradford type thing. I guess I would be surprised if, that, if it got that far, but we've gotten this far already with no Dalton move, so I guess right. I, it's not as... It wouldn't be as big of a shock to me now as it would have been three three weeks ago. If he stays? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's interesting. I mean, I can really see – I don't know. I just – I Burrow's going to be a rookie. He had such a good situation last year. I think there's inevitable regression in, right. in Justice's performance coming into the NFL. Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, I still think I would lean over with what you're saying, but I would, I would just uh, – I would worry about Burrow struggling, and then if they get rid of Dalton, then what right. are they There's doing? There's no floor. Back? Right, because Ryan Finley was not right. it, not yeah. it last year. So that that could be bad. <laughs> right, and and honestly, like I mean, I think Andy Dalton in the Patriots system is an interesting idea for me. Yeah, you know, right now Jared Stidham, the last time I checked, was still minus three fifty in FanDuel Sportsbook to be the starter, which I still just find humorous. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, not that it's not going to work out, but. Um, yeah, Andy Dalton seems like a, a like a fit there. If, yeah. if that could somehow work, I think like it's weird because Stidham's a type of quarterback I would think you'd use if you were trying to get Trevor Lawrence. Uh, but like every other move they've made this right. off season goes counter to that. Like they've re-signed yeah. veterans, they tagged yeah, they're not. It's weird, well, it, and you shouldn't. I I don't think you should try to go for Trevor Lawrence when you have that kind of defense, right? When you exactly. have that kind of talent in their secondary. Or so, just go get I Cam mean, Newton. What? Well, go yeah, get go Cam get, Newton. Let's have some go fun get Cam there. Newton. I mean, look, you know, look what that Broncos uh, defense did with with Peyton Manning right. uh, against Cam Newton in that Super Bowl, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm 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 kind of high on New England, so just very closely monitoring what they're going to do at the quarterback position. I grew up a Jets fan, so I've never rooted in my life for the Patriots. But if they sign Cam Newton, that would be the closest I would get to rooting for them. I, I'm just <laughs> Bill Belichick. If you want my fandom, I'm sure it's super high on your priority list. Go sign yeah. Cam, and well, uh, we can talk. Well, the Jets were the biggest mover in FanDuel Sportsbook on win totals. They moved up. They moved up a whole two tenths of a point in my new Ooh. freshest market rankings. So, so there's some steam. steam on the over on the Jets. A little bit. Ah. Interesting. Bit. Not Tiny sure bit. why, but all right. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure why either. I mean, yeah. uh, I, you know, there wasn't a, there, there were, you know, I would say 28 teams that the price on over and under did not move at all. Yeah. And j- the Jets were one of a few teams. Interesting. Uh, Calvin Theobald is now yell- our video producer is yelling at me because he's also a Jets fan. Um, he's saying it's blasphemous for you to say I'd back the Patriots. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Cal. However, I like Cam, and that takes priority. Let's move into Quarantine Corner for this week. Ed, what have you been doing to occupy your time in these strange, strange, strange uh, times that we are in? Uh, my man, Ryan George. He's a comedian. He does the pitch meetings on uh, Screen Rant. I've raved about him before on this show. Uh, but he did. Uh, he does something called The 90s Show, where... He uh, he's a reporter from the 90s and he's in 2020 and just like all the crazy oh, things <laughs> about what you're say, saying. And it was um, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to laugh at our situation right now, but that's the hardest I've I've laughed at it. Uh, it, it was so good. Um, so, yeah, go check that out. His most recent one on the 90s show. Uh, and then just just binge all the rest of his his stuff it's all really funny on his own private channel and I, didn't sorry, you have a t-shirt of his channel. too what's that didn't you have a t-shirt of his as well i do what is expensive it? brand name expensive brand name t-shirt yeah, yeah. Uh, so what's like the 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 angle i guess of this this youtube channel again uh it's just comedy i mean most of it is him talking to himself which is is kind of funny because he can just write the script and just yeah. do it um which 
he, and he's just hilarious. It's just uh, the angle. I don't know. It's just. I guess funny. I don't know if that's short. the right way to phrase that, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's just short comedy sketches with him talking to himself. Oh, all right. I like it. That's all. Let's check that out. Ryan George uh, for that. Now for mine, we've been doing a lot of documentaries recently. Um, we it's... obviously talked briefly about Tiger King here uh, yeah. because it's obligatory because we are, we are humans who speak and it means we are supposed <laughs> to talk about Tiger King, but I actually liked McMillions more. That was a, an HBO documentary they did about the McDonald's um, uh, monopoly scandal which happened back in, I think, the early 2000s. Basically, I think there was, like, this super long New Yorker article about it, like, a year or so ago, which I had read, and it was, like, this fascinating story about how this marketing agency had basically gotten hacked by this dude who was, like, the head of security and who stole, like, a bunch of game pieces from Monopoly and gave them to his friends, and they'd cash him in for, like, these million-dollar prizes and didn't get caught for, like, 12 years. So this documentary goes to the background of this entire story, talks about how the scheme was done. It has interviews that the FBI conducted at the time, talks about the FBI investigation. And it was a really fun story. It has mob ties in it. It has (laughs) uh, theft. It has intrigue. It has family drama. It has kind of everything that you want. And like, I liked it more than Tiger King personally. I don't know. It was, they had like interesting personalities in it. Um, do you remember that story, Ed? I do not. Okay. I didn't, I, do I did, I was young when it happened. So like, I, I didn't remember, but I read this, this article about it and it was like so fascinating that I saw that HBO had a documentary about it and I was like, let's rev it up, man. This sounds awesome. And it it lived up to it too. It was just one documentary? It was like a movie? six episode documentary oh, okay. oh, wow. on HBO. Huh. Um, it's called McMillions. Actually, I think it's it's available if you have a Hulu account now. We we watched it. On, we have HBO Go. Uh, we watched it on Hulu, and I I liked it. Like I like I am prone to like documentaries a lot. Uh, we are trying to watch one about pandemics, which got really mm. scary and depressing real quick. Uh, so we stopped yep. that one. Uh, but McMillions is you know it's it's pretty light. It's refreshing. It's fun. I'd recommend it. Yeah. That's awesome. And speaking yeah. of the documentaries, I was watching the trailer to the the Michael Jordan uh, yeah. 1990s, uh, 1998 season, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so ESPN, apparently they allowed a camera crew to uh, follow them for that last year. So that was, that was their sixth of six titles. And yeah. part of me is like, how the hell have you been sitting on this footage for right? 22 years? 20, yeah, 22 years? <laughs> like, why hasn't the world seen that? Yeah. Um, and I think in this age where we're not getting any live sports, that's going to be a pretty big deal when ESPN starts dropping those. Absolutely. I think that's Sunday, right? I, I don't know. Okay. Um, I think it's I think it's this weekend. Um, but I have all the DVDs of like the early 30 for 30s, and I'm going to start ripping through those again yeah. pretty soon. Those are fun. 30 for 30s are so good. Yeah. So I, I think. Can't you get them all on ESPN Plus? I think you yep. can. Yeah. Uh, there's actually, they've actually been doing a lot of interesting stuff recently. Like Nick Saban did a breakdown of like Joe Burrow and Tua Tunga Vailoa, which I need to check out at some point. So yeah. um, a lot of interesting stuff. And like if you are a documentary fan, it's a good time. It's a good time yeah. uh, to be consuming media for sure. That is all that we have for today here on Covering the Spread. Big thank you once again to Matthew Holt for swinging by and talking about everything we decided to pepper him on. And make sure you check out uh, the site once again, usintegrity.com, and find Matthew on Twitter at Matthew Holt USI. Ed, what is going on for you? I saw you had an interview, an interview with Jonathan Bales up on the yeah. Football Analytics Show. That's cool. Yeah, I know. It was awesome. Talked to Bales about uh, how he – Never did any specific training to do 2,400 push-ups in 12 hours. We talked about a lot of his counterintuitive tips for entrepreneurship. Uh, I really respect kind of his story and how he's tried a lot of different things and uh, finally made it in the the DFS world. And uh, we talked some sports and DFS and why that's still a good good idea to get into these days. Uh, I, I think Bales is fascinating. So so definitely check that out on the Football Analytics Show. Uh, I have my uh, NFL pre-draft market rankings that I was telling you a little bit about with Green Bay earlier in the show. Uh, you can get that if you sign up for my free email newsletter. Just go to thepowerrank.com slash predictions. Um, and then finally, I just wanted, you were talking about uh, ESPN Plus. And uh, I just want to mention, like, you can get ESPN Plus if you sign up for Disney Plus, like, yes. the, like the, the enhanced version. So, like, the, I can't. There's a package of that with Hulu, I think, too. What's 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like I canceled my like my one ESPN Plus account, canceled my Hulu account, and then ended up saving a buck a month. Yeah. Signing up for Disney Plus and then still getting ESPN Plus and, and Hulu, which I watch a lot of. Yes. Uh, so it's a pretty nice. good deal. I think it's like 12 or 13 bucks a month or something. I didn't see that deal before I signed up for Disney Plus, uh, so I'm paying for everything right now. And uh, once yeah. these contracts run up, I will wise enough. They, they, run, they run out every month, Jim. I, th- I think I know I signed uh, they they had a discount if you locked in for a year and I did that uh, oh, okay <laughs> like it was yeah. like 10 bucks off or something like that I'm like oh yeah sure I'll pay the full thing now and just get it over with what could go wrong <laughs> whoops <laughs> but the yeah, co-host yeah you about a deal yeah exactly learning 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 uh, I am on Twitter at Jim Sanis J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S we have League of Legends Daily Fantasy Podcast now going on the Daily Fantasy uh, podcast feed with myself Brandon Gadula and Tom Vecchio I presi- provide no insights I'm just there asking questions because I know nothing about League of Legends but they do so make sure you check that out on the DFS side of things uh, for the finals coming up this weekend big thank you to Calvin Theobald our video producer and resident Jets fan better Jets fan than I apparently uh for running the video side of thing here today thank you cal as always and thank you to everyone for tuning in hopefully your bets go well if you decide to find markets you enjoy we'll be back again next week to talk more with you uh but until then stay safe stay healthy we'll talk to you again soon this has been covering the spread right here on the fanduel podcast network <laughs>